Welcome back to another We Ourselves video. Today I want to complete my reviews of the Star Wars Disney Plus show, The Acolyte. So let's discuss the final episode as well as my view of the entire series. There will be spoilers for those who may want to actually watch the show. Although at this point, anyone who wanted to do so would have done it already, in my opinion. But even so, spoiler warnings. So we end the episode with episode 8 entitled The Acolyte. Nothing much happens in this episode. It picks up where the last episode ended. Everyone converges on Brindock. Soul finally confesses to Osha that he killed her mom and that he was wrong, which I totally agree with. He was wrong. The last episode went out of its way to show he was obsessed and his thinking was compromised. But that's another topic for another video. Boring Osha, as I like to call her, finally demonstrates some real force powers and chokes Soul to death. Then she bleeds his lightsaber, Crystal, turning the blade red, which is really cool to see in live action. But then afterwards, she acts as if her and her sister are going to go to Applebee's for lunch. It's like it's really anticlimactic after she does that. So anyway, she's the true acolyte, as so many reviewers had guessed. And Kamir is going to train her. But as Vernestra's Force of Jedi's close in, May's concerned that they are going to capture her and use her to find Osha. Why, I don't know. She could have gone with them, but that doesn't matter. Kymir offers to wipe her mind, and May agrees. So after a tearful goodbye with her sister, Kamir wipes her mind, and he and Osha escape. They find May, and of course they take her back to Coruscant. We see Vernestra covering up what happens by lying to the Senate Council and blaming everything on Sol. And I can't say I feel any kind of way about that because they didn't make Sol a sympathetic character, in my opinion. As expected, Vernestra is going to try to use May, but not to find Osha. She wants to use May to find Chimere because we discover that Chimere is wearing that helmet because he doesn't want Vernestra to sense him and know that he's alive. So it's confirmed once again what everybody speculated that she was his former Jedi Master and she was the one who put those marks on his back. I actually joked with my friend that the big mystery for season two is going to be that scene where we actually see how and why he gets the scars on his back. They're going to drag that out for a second season and reveal that in episode eight. What this says about her training techniques, which resemble the way a Sith would train an acolyte or an apprentice, that's never explored in this show because the show has no world building, but we'll get to that shortly. Let's see what else happens. Well, we get a cameo from Darth Plagueis. He's hiding out in Chimere's cave, apparently. And the final shot is Vernestra going to see Yoda to obviously lie to him about the failed mission to Brendok. My overall feeling about the Acolyte as a Star Wars live action show is a profound sense of frustration. I guess it can best be summed up in a conversation that I had with my friend when we were talking about episode seven. In particular, I was talking about the scenes with Padawan Torben and Mother Anasea and the scenes with Master Indar, Torben and Soul. And as I explained what I was getting out of those scenes, my friend said something very interesting to me. He said, maybe you're giving the writers more credit than they deserve. Maybe you are envisioning the show that could have been. And when I stopped and thought about it, I had to agree that my friend was right. I was giving the writers too much credit, and although I feel like what I was reading in the scene was substantiated by things in the show, I was acting on what I was envisioning as the better show. My friend was right. And that's the reason why I'm so frustrated, because I can see all the areas in the show that could have been so good, but nothing was ever done, nothing was never expanded on, it was just all left on the ground. Putting aside all the violations of canon or bringing in characters deliberately so that they could provoke Star Wars fans, yes, I agree with people that Leslie Headland, the showrunner, did that on purpose. It was a dumbass move. But putting all that stuff aside, there were still lots of areas that they could have explored in this show and they didn't. This is the High Republic. I wanted to see them establish the High Republic in live action. 
One of the key things about true sci-fi and fantasy fans, people who love it, whether they're reading a book or watching a movie or playing a game or watching a TV show, is the world building. It's necessary. It's not fans being nitpicky and stuff. Having the rules to the science and technology or the magic systems that you're using, knowing all that stuff helps us with our imagination to picture these worlds and to enter into these fantasy realms and these adventures. World building is part of it. The Acolyte does no world building. More importantly, they do not expand on these characters. This to me is a fatal flaw within the Acolyte. They were so concerned with this incident on Brendock and they milked it for all it's worth. And when they finally show you what was supposed to be from all these different perspectives, all they are giving you is what happened to these characters in that moment over those couple of days. What you don't get is where these characters came from. So you don't really understand what's going on with them. So let's look at three examples of where the Acolyte series failed its characters. I pointed out to my friend, I think I said it in my last video, it's clear there's something going on with Padawan Torben. The reason that he could not say what he wanted, particularly when Mother Anasea went into his mind, and you see a tear come down his cheek, obviously this is something painful to him, but he could not say it. He could not verbalize what he wanted because he knew he would be put out of the Jedi Order. And there's really only one thing that gets a Padawan thrown out, and that's attachment to somebody or something that interferes with their training. We saw it with Anakin. We even saw it with Obi-Wan in the Clone Wars where he wasn't honest with Anakin about his feelings towards um, Bo-Katan's older sister. But he did finally admit that had she said yes to him, he would not have become a Jedi. He would have given it up. So we are told in canon in the other shows that really the only thing that really gets you messed up is an attachment. And if Torben is shedding a tear, he is interested in somebody he's attached to somebody and he's suppressing that attachment he's breaking that attachment he's not giving in to his normal desires as mother anasea picked up on and it was bothering him and then when you have that scene with master indera and soul when they're talking to osha and soul says to osha you have to have the courage to say what you want they do a close-up shot on indera and she turns and looks at torben and he looks back at her it's clear that she knows that he ain't being honest but you have to read all of that stuff into it you have to look for these clues and then you have to speculate because they did not tell us anything we did not see anything we did not see who these people were before the events on brendock We are shown in episode seven that Jedi Knight Soul, he has this obsession with getting Osha, putting aside the, the weirdness of it, a grown man trying to get his hands on this little black girl, but he's told by Endera, you're allowing your emotions to cloud you. And then he has an emotional outburst. We're never told why he is so gung-ho to even ignore Jedi Council orders. In all those interior episodes, they could have had a scene where he explains it to somebody. We see a flashback. Anything like that would have helped to humanize his character and explain why Jedi Soul was off his mark during that episode. I want to do what's best for Osha. You don't get to decide that. This is the biggest misstep of the Acolyte. The entire time I'm watching this series, I'm wondering why we get no flashback scenes of Osha during her time as a Padawan. Her failure to complete her training sounded interesting to me because it reminded me of Ahsoka's journey. Yet, we never get one flashback. Then, in episode eight, Osha faces May, and she talks about her suppressed anger about how she failed her training and why. We are told about her past, but never shown. You can't put off revealing the main character's background for a possible second season. We needed to see it now. If this had been a legitimate show from the very beginning, there's no way Hedlund and her writing team would have sat in their writer's room and decided to tell us Osha's background rather than showing us. This more than anything else convinces me this was never meant to be a real complete show. 
The characterization and world building for a show full of new characters is totally frustrating because there was no attempt to really build the High Republic era of the Jedi on screen. But I don't even think their ultimate goal is to bring in people who aren't traditionally science fiction and fantasy lovers. I just think they're just damaging all of these properties because of what these properties meant. From the first movie, Star Wars has been part of my life growing up in all its iterations. <laughs> What I mean is to go to a sci-fi convention and stand next to somebody who you've never met before, but yet you can carry on a conversation. You don't know what their politics are. You don't know what any of their views on anything else is. What you know is you like Star Wars, you like Star Trek. And I think that type of unity is at heart not what the powers that be want. When I watched episode seven, I did not expect to have the reaction that I did. And I had to step back and think about it and acknowledge that I had a very visceral reaction to what I basically saw was an innocent black woman being killed by the duly constituted authority. That was my response. And when I heard other people make excuses and say she should have complied, again, see, I used the word complied. It's like I had to sit back and say, wow, that caught me by surprise. And then I realized that's what they're doing. The creators of The Acolyte, are deliberately dividing the Star Wars fan base the same way groups in our larger society are being divided. These franchises had a unifying effect across cultures, across countries, across nationalities, across racial lines, across sexual identity. And so I think that is why these properties are being destroyed, why they are deliberately creating content that is polarizing. You could have added diversity without also tying it to less quality. It's like you're deliberately feeding and pushing people to the extremes so that they react emotionally in the extreme. You're doing it on purpose and it's actually diabolical in my opinion. So ultimately, for me, the acolyte represents that because the bad writing actually isn't bad writing. It's done on purpose to promote division, in my humble opinion. The reaction that they are getting is what they want. It's actually masterful, if you think about it, because it's manipulative. So that's my opinion. You can tell me what you feel in the comments. I don't mind. <laughs> but as always, like, share, subscribe, and I will see you in the next video.